Learning to hear and pronounce the tones in Mandarin as an adult learner can be tricky, but with the right methods, anyone can do it. Hello and welcome to the Hacking Chinese podcast. In this week's episode, we are going to finish our little series of episodes focusing on tones. In the first part, we talked about what tones are, and then in the second part, we talked about the importance of learning tones, and then in this, the third part, we're going to talk about how to learn tones, and that includes both how to learn to hear the tones and, of course, how to pronounce them yourself. Before we get started with that, I'd like to announce that my pronunciation course, Hacking Chinese Pronunciation, Speaking with Confidence, is now open for registration and it will remain open for the remainder of the week. This is a full video course that will teach you everything you need to know to master Mandarin pronunciation, regardless if you are a beginner or a more advanced student. This includes, but is not limited to tones, I also go through all the initials and finals, and then also more advanced topics relating to stress, intonation, and things like that. For more information about the course, please go to pronunciation.hackingchinese.com and like I said, the course will be open for registration for the remainder of this week. And if you're listening to this in the future, you can still head over to pronunciation.hackingchinese.com and see if the course is open. And if it isn't, you'll be able to leave your email address so I can contact you when the course opens again. So let's now turn to the topic of this episode, which is how to learn tones. And I've split this discussion into five parts. So first we're going to talk about learning how to hear the tones, and then we're going to follow up by discussing how to learn to say the tones. We're also going to talk about the importance of using tone pairs, and then I'm going to offer some advice on how to identify and fix problems with tones, and this is then of course particularly useful if you are not a beginner. And then finally, I'm going to answer some questions that often come up when teaching or discussing tones. So let's start with talking about how to hear the tones. As babies, we can hear all the possible speech sounds, and this sounds like a superpower, it would be awesome to have this as an adult, because then you would be able to hear the tones, and you would easily be able to distinguish any sound in any foreign language that you learn. However, this is not how human languages work, instead we group sounds together into categories and then perceive them as being roughly the same sound, even if they are slightly different. For example, if we take the consonant pair B and P in English, we can see that when we start voicing determines which of these consonants we are saying. So if we start voicing before we release the vowel, it turns into a B, and if I exaggerate even more, B you can hear that the voicing starts before the consonant. However, if I start the voicing later, you will instead perceive this as a P. And the reason I bring this up is that we perceive things based on these categories. So for example, if we look at two different types of P's in English, such as in PIN, P-I-N, and in SPIN, S-P-I-N, the PIN one is aspirated, it has the voice onset time when the voicing starts much later than the one in SPIN, but we still perceive both of these as the letter P, and most people can't even hear a difference between the two and think of them as the same sound, because they are one and the same phoneme in English. In other languages this is different, so some have a three-way split, so BIN, SPIN and PIN are three different consonants, whereas in English it's only two different consonant sounds. Other languages have two different phonemes, just like English does, but the dividing line is not in the same place. So Mandarin is a good example here, because if we take a word like Beijing, the B here is not voiced. It's not Beijing, it's Beijing. And when we have P in pinyin, it's more aspirated than in English. In phonology, this is called categorical perception, and it's basically the idea that we don't perceive every single speech sound on a continuum, instead we sort them into specific categories, and then we call these categories a phoneme. This particular case with B and P is related to voice onset time, if you want to look it up, but I'm not going to dig deeper in this episode, because we are, after all, going to talk about tones. And so the reason I brought up B and P is that that's something we all got a relationship to, because we all speak languages where B and P exist, and we have categories for these firmly established in our minds. 
This means that even if people who speak English all use slightly different versions of a P, we have different voices and we say things in different ways and so on, we still perceive them as being a P. Now, when we learn Mandarin, we need to establish new phonological categories for tones, where there previously were no categories at all, because tones are not used in English. If you started learning Mandarin as a baby, you would just maintain your ability to hear tones and gradually figure out how people around you sorted them into different categories, and you'd be fine, you'd be a native speaker. However, this podcast is aimed at second language learners, and you might have heard that there is a critical period during which you can learn phonology and syntax to a native level, and then after that it's impossible. This way of looking at things is a little bit outdated, because while it's true that if you want to reach a level that is indistinguishable from a native speaker, you needed to have started when you were a baby. But this does not mean that you cannot learn to hear new speech sounds, and that includes tones. Therefore, it is perhaps more accurate to talk about a sensitive period, because certainly it's easier to learn these things as a kid than it is as an adult. Generally speaking, research into categorical perception for second language learners have focused on two different approaches that have both been shown to be effective. The first is called high variability training, and that is when you are systematically exposed to the target sounds, or tones in this case, and given immediate feedback if you perceive them correctly or not. And this has to be done across many different speakers to be effective, because otherwise you just learn to understand the tones produced by one person, say your teacher, and that is not the goal of course, you want to understand tones spoken by anybody. As part of a research project, I actually created a tone training course together with Kevin Boloy over at Wordswing, and it's still there and it's still for free and you can use it if you struggle with basic tones. So it implements this high variability training in an online context. And if you're interested in the tone training course or anything else that I mention in this episode, I will provide links in the show notes, but you should also check out the written article on Hacking Chinese, which is easier to navigate and where you will be able to find all the information you want. The second line of research has focused on learning by exaggeration, which is similar to how we speak with children. So we might make a difference exaggerated, so say if we want to contrast the high and the low tone, we make the high tone extra high and the low tone extra low. And this then makes it easier for a new student to perceive the difference between the tones. And then, once they can hear the difference between the exaggerated versions, you make them less exaggerated gradually until you say them normally and the student will be able to follow along until you say the tones as normal people do. This is not something you can do on your own, but most teachers actually do this naturally without even being aware of the research that has been done in this area. Naturally, a vast majority of students don't use either of these methods explicitly, and most teachers, like I said, are not aware of these methods and this research anyway, but most students still figure out how to hear the difference between the tones, even if it might take a while. You can also rely on the principles that I've mentioned without it being research-based. So, for example, if you listen to a large variety of Chinese people speaking, not just your teacher, you're trying to understand what they say and so on, your brain will gradually figure out what the difference is between the tones and be able to sort the tones into the correct categories. But if you're listening to only one person and don't listen that much, and don't even understand much of what's being said, then you will struggle with tones. If you want to read more about hearing the sounds and tones in Mandarin, I've written a separate article about that that I will link in the description, although it is a little bit out of date and due for an update. Okay, let's move on to the second part of this episode, where we will talk about pronouncing tones yourself. And I put the parts in this order because if you don't hear the tones, it will be difficult to consistently pronounce them correctly as well. But when you learn to hear the tones, you can correct yourself, and then getting better at tones is just a matter of practice. Whereas if you don't hear the tones, speaking more might not help that much, because you might just be making the same mistakes over and over, and you don't hear the difference. So this is just another reason why listening is so important, and it is indeed the first of the four pillars to learning to pronounce the tones yourself. The second pillar is mimicking, and this then combines listening attentively to some recorded audio, and then trying to mimic that as closely as you can. 
There are many ways of mimicking. You can listen to what someone says, then repeat it after them. You can do chorus mimicking, which is what I think is the most effective way to learn pronunciation. And that is when you say something along with the native speaker. And essentially you try to say something with them, overlapping their pronunciation perfectly. If you were to record at the end, you will produce a recording that is as close as possible to the original recording. And of course, your voice is not the same as the person speaking on the recording, but you should try to get as close as possible. To learn more about this, check out episode 162, which is a video episode where I also show how you can do chorus mimicking with a free program like Audacity. The third pillar of learning to pronounce tones and other sounds in Mandarin is theory. In essence, this just means being aware of what you're doing and making sure that you're aiming for the right target. A good example of this is the third tone, and I have a personal example here because I did exactly this thing when I started learning Chinese. I didn't realize that the third tone was a low tone, and that meant that when I was practicing pronunciation, I was aiming for the wrong target. And it doesn't matter if you hit the target if it's the wrong target. But as soon as I realized, oh, it's actually a low tone in almost all situations, except in front of another third tone, as we discussed in the first part in this episode, then I was able to gradually home in on the target and learn to pronounce the third tone correctly. And don't get me wrong here, I'm not saying that you need to take courses in phonology and phonetics to learn how to pronounce Mandarin in a clear manner, I just mean that knowing what the target is can be immensely helpful as an adult when you try to learn these new sounds and tones. Actually, I would say that the theory that I go through in this series of episodes is a good start, and if you want more, particularly about the initials and finals, you should check out my pronunciation course, which contains a little bit more information and advice than the average student needs, but that is because when you struggle with something, you do want to be able to delve deeper into that specific area of pronunciation, and then it's great to know that the information is there. So finally, the fourth pillar of successful pronunciation in Mandarin, or indeed in any other language, is feedback. This is particularly important in relation to what I said about hearing tones earlier, because if you don't hear what you are saying, or you don't hear when you're making a mistake, it will be very hard to improve. So you need feedback from other people to identify your weakest areas, and then you can work on improving those. And normally, you can't just ask people how good your pronunciation is, because most native speakers will just praise your Chinese, no matter how good or bad it is, and say that your pronunciation is excellent, even if it isn't. They don't do this to deceive you, of course, it's just a friendly way of encouraging you and cheering you on. But it's not very helpful for evaluating your pronunciation. We talked about how to get feedback in episode 8 of the podcast, but I also want to mention that the pronunciation course has a feedback add-on where I give you feedback on your pronunciation. As a beginner, you will get feedback as you work your way through the sections and lessons of the course, and as a more advanced student, I will give you a comprehensive check of your pronunciation, highlight some things you need to work on, and then give you follow-up feedback when you've had time to practice a bit. This brings us to the third part of this episode, where we're going to talk about tone pairs. I've talked about tone pairs in previous parts in this series, but now it's time to delve a little bit deeper and see how they can be helpful for mastering tones. So the challenge we face when learning tones in Mandarin is that single tones are not that bad, but when you put them into sentences, everything falls apart. There are so many things to keep track of, tones change depending on context, and now that you have to pronounce more than one in a row, it's easy to get overwhelmed and not be able to say anything right. Tone pairs is the best solution to this, because most words in Mandarin have two syllables, and even if there are words that have three, four, or five syllables, they are much rarer and you can use what you learn from the tone pairs in these longer words as well. So when you have a good grasp of single tones plus tone pairs, you will be equipped to say anything in Chinese clearly and with confidence. When I say tone pair here, I mean a combination of two tones, and since there are four tones in Mandarin, it follows that there are four times four equals 16 tone pairs. But then we also have the neutral tone, but that can only appear on the second syllable, not the first, so we have to add another four for a total of 20. The best way to approach this is to learn one word for each tone pair, so that means 20 words in Mandarin that you should master so well that you can say them with confidence correctly every single time. 
If I wake you up in the middle of the night and ask you about these words, you should still be able to say them correctly without hesitation. Getting to where you can do that is not necessarily easy, but it's not that bad either. We're only talking about 20 words, and with some dedication and practice, everybody can learn this. The idea then is that when you've mastered these tone pairs, you can use the tone patterns from these pairs to pronounce any word in Mandarin. If you check out the written article on Hacking Chinese, I have listed the 20 words that I suggest that you use, and I've also provided audio for them if you want to listen. You should also check out episode 87, which was dedicated specifically to tone pairs, and this is one of the reasons I started the podcast, because these things are much easier to talk about, of course, than they are to write about. Here I'm only going to show you one example, so you know what I mean, but for all the other examples, check out episode 87 or the written article. So let's say you struggle with the combination third tone plus second tone, and in my experience this is one of the trickiest combinations, and it's probably the one that students get wrong the most. So what you do here is that you choose one word with this combination of tones, and you master it. The word I use is nu er, daughter, but you can also use mei guo for America if you're American, or wu shi as in 50. It does not matter, of course, which word you use, what matters is that you really, really learn this word. And then when you encounter another word with the same combination, because you've practiced this one so much, you're much more likely to get the new word right, and if you struggle with it, you can explicitly compare it with the model word that you have mastered. So let's say you encounter the word kanung, meaning maybe, and you struggle with this. Maybe somebody says you pronounce it incorrectly, or you have some other reason to believe that it's not right. Well, then take your model word, nu er, say it a few times, because you know you're getting this right, nu er, nu er, and then you say ka nung, nu er, ka nung, nu er, ka nung, ka nung, ka nung. And there you go, you are now pronouncing this new word correctly. I have used this method to coach and teach pronunciation to many, many students, and this almost never fails. I would say that it's hard to find some activity that is more worthwhile if you're a beginner or even lower intermediate student than mastering these 20 combinations. Let's move on to the next part, which is about identifying and fixing problems with tones. In an ideal world, we would all learn tones perfectly from the beginning and we wouldn't need to relearn or fix problems, but this is not realistic and all students will have some things that they need to fix. So how do you do that? The most important thing to realize is that there are many different types of issues you might have, and that the solution depends entirely on what the problem is. You can't just say that your tones are bad and expect me to give you advice on how to fix it. We need to see what the problem is. This is something I covered in more detail in an article called Seven Kinds of Tone Problems and What You Should Do About Them, and the seven kinds are the following. First, not hearing the tones. We've already talked about that. Second, not being able to produce basic tones. Third, not remembering the correct tone. Fourth, not being able to produce the tone in demanding contexts. Five, not being aware of phonological rules, and that's the tone change rules I've been talking about. Sixth, mixing up tones and intonation. Seventh, falling back into old habits. Many of these are self-explanatory, and if you don't agree, you can always check out that article, but I think you can agree that depending on which of these problems you have, the solution is then different. The problem of not remembering the correct tone is of course different from not being able to say it, because as I said earlier, if you're aiming for the wrong target, of course you're going to get it wrong. And if your problem is that you can't hear the difference between two tones, the solution is not to just say them over and over, as this is unlikely to help. I'm going to say a few words about remembering tones, but before we do that, I'd like to introduce a method you can use to check your tones, and this is useful both for listening and speaking yourself. This is a form of minimal pair bingo, and if you want a thorough explanation, we talked about this in episode 58. So what you do is that you write down in a table or a list, or you can take the table that I created for that article and episode, and you practice with a native speaker. In the table, you will have all the possible combinations of tones, but I don't suggest that you use all of them at once, so maybe focus on just one row or one column. For example, we might practice only combinations that start with the third tone. So third plus first tone, third plus second tone, 
third plus third tone, and then third plus fourth tone. You can of course also include the neutral tone if you want. You then decide on a specific syllable and use only that to pronounce these tone pairs. So I usually use ma, ma, and then you can say, for example, then for third tone, first tone, it would be ma, ma. And if you're practicing third plus second tone, you would say ma, ma. And then for third, third, it would be ma, ma. And then for third, fourth, it would be ma, ma. If you want to include a neutral tone, it would be ma, ma. And so you write down maybe 10 of these nonsense words that you're going to say, and you check whether or not the native speaker can identify the correct cells in the table. Naturally, you need to explain to them what you're doing and maybe try it out a bit so they know what's going on, but usually they will understand rather quickly and will be able to point to the right cell in the table, assuming that your pronunciation is correct. If the native speaker hesitates or points to the wrong cell, then you know that your pronunciation is not very good and you might need to work on something here. Note that native speakers learn how you pronounce the tones, so after a bit one specific native speaker might be able to point to the right cell even though you're still making mistakes, but then you can just do this with somebody else and see what they say. You can also reverse this exercise and have them saying these nonsense words and you pointing to the cells in the table. The reason we are using nonsense words here is that otherwise the native speaker can usually identify what you're trying to say even if you have the wrong tones. So for example, if you wanted to check if your third tone plus second tone was accurate and you say mei guo, this is not really a good test because even if you say mei guo or mei guo or something else that is incorrect, your teacher, native speaking friend or somebody else, they know that you intended to say mei guo, America, and then they will know that it is a low tone plus a rising tone that is the correct answer, even if you say something else. In some specific cases, you might be able to construct pairs or even triplets of words that differ only in tone. So you could have third tone plus first tone, lao shi, meaning teacher, third tone plus second tone, lao shi, meaning honest, and then you could have third tone plus fourth tone, lao shi, meaning always. The problem is, of course, that these are hard to come up with and you definitely cannot find a pair of syllables where you can do this for all 20 combinations, and even finding something that works with three is a stretch. Before we get to the questions and answers and wrap up this episode, let's talk a little bit about remembering tones. Like I said, if you remember the tone incorrectly, your pronunciation will be off no matter how hard you try. The first thing you should do is to focus on tones, and I think if you've listened this far you've realized that tones are important and that you need to focus on them. Sometimes students ask if they have to write tones when they write pronunciation on the exam, and of course you have to write the tones, it's a little bit like asking if you're supposed to include the vowels, and yes, you are supposed to do that too. Beyond that, and especially when you struggle with remembering a specific tone, I think using mnemonics can be very useful. And this is not something I can go into great detail here, because this episode is long enough as it is, but I'll make sure to put links in the description so you can read up on it on your own. But in short, you can create a system where you associate each tone with a color, and we talked about colors already, and then also an element. If you're using the most common coloring system, first tone is red, and then associate that with fire. The second tone is yellow, so associate that with dazzling light. And then the third tone is green, so you can associate that with greenery or plants. And then the fourth tone is blue, so associate that with water. Then whenever you encounter a word where you just can't remember the tones, use these elements and incorporate them into your picture or story or whatever it is you use to remember the character. So to give you a simple example, if you're remembering the character for mother, which consists of woman plus horse, as your mother being ridden by a horse, which is rather bizarre and easy to remember. Then if you struggle to remember the tone, which is the first tone, ma, you can then include fire as well, so the horse is riding your mother in a burning inferno or something like that. I think it's usually overkill to rely on this method all the time, but bring it out when there is a tone you just can't remember. So let's wrap up this episode by quickly answering five questions about learning tones, and many of these I have already addressed indirectly. Question number one, am I too old to learn tones? 
And the answer is no, you're not. It will be harder to learn tones if you're an adult compared to if you're an infant. And maybe it's harder the older you get, I mean, as an adult, but you can definitely learn tones. I have taught and coached many students in their 60s and 70s, and they can learn tones, and so can you. Naturally, you might be too busy to learn tones or not be able to invest the necessary time and energy, but you can definitely learn tones if you want to. Question number two, does using colors make it easier to learn tones? This has actually been experimentally investigated and the result was that no, colors did not make it easier to learn tones, but I do think there can still be practical value in using colors. For example, we just saw how you could use elements based on the colors to remember tones, and it might also be convenient to color characters to make the tones easier to see and so on. If you want to know more about this, we talked about it in episode 34. Question number four, is musical aptitude necessary to learn tones? The answer is no, but it might make it easier to perceive the tones, at least initially. The tones in Mandarin are quite different from musical tones because they are relative and it's about pitch contours, not absolute pitch height. So for example, when I say a first tone, it is obviously higher than when I say a third tone, but my high tone is still probably lower than most females' low tone and so on. So it's about relative pitch, it is not about hitting a specific note or anything like that. You can be tone deaf and still speak perfect Mandarin, and Chinese people don't all have perfect pitch. These are two different things. Question number four, how do tones work in music? The simple answer is that tones are largely ignored when singing in Mandarin, so the music takes over and overwrites the tones. This of course makes it harder to understand a song compared to normal speech, but as we have discussed, you can rely on context and lots of other things to figure out what songs mean anyway. I did address this question in slightly more detail in episode 178. Finally, question number five. What are the best resources for learning tones? As I mentioned in the first part in this series, I'm not going to talk about it here on the podcast because resources change and I want to be able to recommend the best ones, so do check the written article on Hacking Chinese for more resources. That being said, I still have to shamelessly promote my own pronunciation course, which is open for registration until the end of this week. And as I said earlier, if you listen to this episode in the future, you can still head over to pronunciation.hackingchinese.com for more information, and you will also be able to leave your email address so I can notify you next time the course is open. Okay, so that was a long episode and a long series focusing on tones. I hope you found it helpful, and if you have further questions or comments, please head over to the written article on Hacking Chinese and let me know what you think. And most importantly, good luck with practicing your tones! Thank you for tuning in to the Hacking Chinese podcast. If you like this episode, please share it. More information and inspiration about learning and teaching Chinese can be found at hackingchinese.com. See you in the next episode, and until then, good luck with your studies!